Welcome. I'm Kelly Piacenti. I'm with Mass Mutual Special Care Unit. I'm actually the head of special care. And I have my friend and colleague with me here today, Jerry Hulick, who's with the Washington Group, who's also a special care planner with Mass Mutual. So last time we presented for the American College, and thank you so much for having us back, we spoke a little bit about government benefits. We were asked to come back and do a deeper dive. So today we're gonna to go a little more into government benefits. And um, we just like to say welcome, and hopefully today this is uh, helpful in whatever you may do in your practice. But before we begin, the first thing that I wanna talk about is important disclosures. So the information provided is not written or intended to as specific tax or legal advice, mass mutuals, its subsidiaries, um, employees and representatives are not authorized to give tax or legal advice. Individuals are encouraged to seek advice from their own tax or legal counsel. Individuals involved in a state planning process should work with an estate planning team, including their own personal or legal tax counsel. So let's get going. So Jared, do you wanna jump in here? Yeah, so Kelly, this is a slide that we went through the last time, so we won't spend much time here. But again, keep in mind that there are entitlement benefits that we're all paying into Social Security to get. It's important when doing planning that you get up-to-date information about your Social Security benefits and the benefits of our clients, uh, dealing with both the retirement income issues, which people focus on, disability coverages, but most importantly, the family benefits, spousal benefits, survivor benefits, and children's benefits that many people really don't spend a whole lot of time, whole lot of time looking at or really understanding. We always encourage that uh, they get current statements. They go online to ssa.gov, download their statements, look for anything that might need to be corrected, which can only be done over a three-year period, and then just get more familiar with the benefit structures that exist if there are to be a life event. And of course, the last benefit we all get at 65 or a disability situation is Medicare. So Kelly, you wanna run quickly through the uh, public assistance? Sure, I mean, public assistance, keep in mind, means-based. So when we talk about SSI, means-based, monthly um, income for those with limited income. So you always wanna keep that in mind, limited income, minimum economic security to, to really help someone. It's not a tremendous amount, but certainly a limited amount to help them. When we talk about Medicaid, it's free or low-cost health care. Um, typically for low-income family, but once again, people with disabilities are often eligible for Medicaid as well. When we talk about public supports, we're really talking about something called SNAP, which formerly known as food stamps. Um, so you've got to have in a three-person household, I think the family income cannot be over 20780 to qualify for SNAP, which is also food stamps. The other assistance program is, well, temporary assistance for needy families. It can help with childcare, um, job prep, work assistance. If you qualify, these are some of the things that it would cover. The other um, benefit that's available is the child health care um, insurance program, often known as CHIP. If you apply for Medicaid, they will tell you if you qualify for CHIP. If you don't qualify for Medicaid, that doesn't mean you don't qualify for CHIP. So you have to keep that in mind when you're speaking with these government officials, when you have your appointment, just because you're not eligible for one doesn't mean you're not eligible for all. But these are some of the public assistance programs that some of our families need and really rely upon. So resource tested benefits, once again, um, it's really based on your income, social security income, Medicaid, SNAP, Children's Health Insurance Program, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, and Federal Assisted Housing. If your income is too high, you will not be eligible for these programs. But keep in mind, as Jerry and I had went over last time, a person with a disability, and I always give the example of my son, lived in my house when he was over the age of 18. He lived under our roof, but it was based on his income, and he would have qualified for all of these programs. So we have many families that don't think they qualify for some of these resource tested benefits, but technically when the person's over 18, many of them are based on their actual income. So don't say that you're not eligible for them until you actually have that conversation. 
And there's some confusion around that, but there isn't uh, generally the benefits going to come into play when a child turns age 18 because it's based on his own income versus the parents' uh, incomes being deemed in the equation. But there are also asset tests and, and uh, as a part of the means test that if there's too much assets that have been accumulated, they can cause a problem. And so it's important to always be recognized what exists out there even beyond maybe the family you may be talking to. <clears throat> Did grandparents buy bonds or something like that? So because of this resource test for public benefits, you have to have the broad picture of what's out there. So Kelly, how about SSI? Well, really a monthly benefit with a person, it's a monthly benefit to a person with limited resources. Um, it's designed to really help those that are disabled, those that are blind, who have little or no income. It provides cash to meet basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter. And keep that in mind, basic needs, because people get a little crazy when they see this and think it's this tremendous amount of money. It is not. It is there to provide basic needs. It's resource tested. To be eligible, you must have less than $2,000 or 3,000 as a couple of countable assets. And when we say countable assets, that's not the vehicle because your vehicle is not gonna be considered, but it's other things you may have. Maybe you have a diamond ring worth $2,000 or $3,000. That could potentially disqualify you. So you really want to make sure that you know that this is a means-based um, criteria that you have to be eligible for or you will not. It's countable assets, so you will not qualify. Now, SSI can vary a little bit by state. There are some states that have some additional amount of money that could be added to SSI. Uh, we've seen some states really tightening down on whether or not there is a component of residential piece of SSI that's going to be received. Do you have a lodging agreement in place? We many times don't like to use the term rental agreement, but a lodging agreement where you're going to be reimbursed for room and board. All of these are factors when you're going to the Social Security offices and having the planners have a better understanding of that application process is just going to prepare any family to go in and be better prepared when they're applying for these kinds of benefits. Many people will say to us, it's almost like they deny you first, first round just to make sure that they've got all the backup to uh, make qualification possible. But it's, a, it's an important benefit, needs to be asked for. Don't assume that all families understand what it is and that it exists. Now, when we talked, Kelly mentioned, when we talked about resources, you see what are resources on this one side, and generally the ones that can cause us problems are ones that you see on this left side, like cash or bank accounts. Now, you're allowed to have a vehicle, one vehicle you see on the other side, and particularly if you're using it in a way for transportation uh, for any kind of a work environment situation, uh, life insurance is a little bit confusing in that you really don't want to own life insurance, the individual, yet a family or parent could own life insurance on a child. It's who owns the asset that comes into play. So certain personal property, all of these may be deemed a portion of the resources, whether there's a spouse involved in a disability situation or parents under the age of 18. If the child's under 18, the parents' uh, assets are deemed in that equation. So all of those are there. I encourage you to go. Many of us working in with long-term care insurance, we've seen these kinds of things from Medicaid, uh, enrollment, and, and eligibility. Uh, just go online and look at Social Security countable and non-countable assets and be familiar with those and what counts. This is nothing more than an overview right here so that you can uh, really have an understanding of what it, what it should be when you're going to apply. Any, anything to add there, Kelly? No, I mean, well, we are getting some questions in the chat. We did get a question about what if you have more than one vehicle? Typically, they're looking to see that you have one vehicle. If you have two or three vehicles, you could be considered um, to have gone over the threshold. So you want to keep that in mind. They really don't want you to have anything that's beyond the basics. So anything beyond the basics, like property that you own, that's one thing. You live in a house. If you own three houses, it's a little bit different story. So you want to make sure that you're under a resource that they don't consider non-countable. Non-countable are some of the things that you can have, but it can't be an excessive amount. The other thing that we're going to talk a little bit about today is um, ABLE. You can have some money in ABLE and it's not going to affect you, but we'll go over the limits on that as well. 
And you see on this, uh, le- the right-hand side, the uh, the PASS program where you can, in many states, they develop a program of development as you would begin to age out. So if you had a vehicle that you were using for transportation for employment, then that's going to be a vehicle that you could have. There might be two or three vehicles in a household, but who owns them? That's the important thing. Who owns the asset when you're looking at, out at both countable and non-countable assets? Right. So I so think, is- Kelly, you pretty much talked about this, about, you know, the deeming rules. And we talk about, you know, uh, you want to make sure that you know what counts, uh, with, which we've just talked about. Prior to age 18, the parents' incomes are going to be included in that. And yet, at the same time, we want to make sure that uh, we're getting, you know, all the benefit possibility we can get uh, because of the assets that we may have. Anything to add there, Kelly? Yeah, I just, once again, you want to meet the basic needs of food and shelter. It's not something tremendous. We get calls every day. Kelly, they're not going to get that much money. What exactly is it? They're trying to meet the needs. They're not there, you know, supplement, not supplant. So, I mean, keep that in mind. That's exactly what it is. But any income in an item an individual receives are cash or in kind, that can be used to meet his or her need for food or shelter which includes the purpose of SSI, the receipt of any item which can be applied either directly or by sale or conversion to meet the basic needs of food or shelter. So you always want to keep that in mind. So this can be an ominous uh, look at uh, how what does not count for SSI. But the first few bullets really speak to the issue that the first $20 for most income received each month is excluded for $65 of earnings and half the earnings over $65. The bottom line, when you start looking at as it applies today, you can earn up to about $1,310 a month before there's going to begin to be any sort of an offset. And I think when you look at all the various things that could come in play, both earned income, income tax refunds, uh, any kind of credits that you might have received, all of those have the potential to create a situation that would be deemed as more income. Uh, any work-related expenses, though, are going to come off the top. But if you receive certain grants or any sort of subsidization, and we've seen people where a parent has been asked, you know, what uh, what what lodging number are you charging? And they may say 350, and then they'll ask the question, well, if somebody came off the street and uh, and you were going to rent them the same space, would you charge the same? And if the parent answered no, we would charge them more. Well, that means that they're giving in-kind support. They're giving an additional amount of support. So we got to be careful when we're dealing with the Social Security offices. And to be perfectly honest, sometimes we see some inconsistencies in the answers that we get. But the bottom line is to really understand, if you understand these particular things that come into play and really understand and coach the family around the presentation that's going to take place to their eligibility, then we're going to really be servicing and helping the families to get the right result when it comes to qualifying for SSI and even Medicaid. Many of the states, it's a single application for both SSI and Medicaid. Some states, it's distinct applications. I know in Virginia, where I am, it's a distinct application. So it really depends. And and to be helpful in coaching, we don't necessarily need to be doing these forms for them, but to be coaching as to the process is an important thing that we can always help families with. Anything to add there, Kelly? Um, just a couple things. When we talk about lodging, which you can't say you charge them rent, when a person turns 18, as we were describing with my son, I could have charged him what they refer to as lodging. One of the things you want to keep in mind that I think some of our families don't realize, if there are four people over the age of 18 in the house, you can't charge the person with special needs the full amount of the mortgage. It has to be divided amongst the adults in the house. So if the if the mortgage is $400 a month, you have four adults over the age of 18, it would be $100 a person. So you want to keep that in mind that any time that you're claiming or you're saying this is what we pay for, they actually want you to calculate that correctly. The other thing is if you own a house or there's a house that a person with a disability is staying in and you charge them rent, as Jerry had said, someone else has to be charged the same amount. So you always want to keep that in mind. This is actually a great chart. I'm taking a look at it. It's very overwhelming for me to take a look at, but we have a lot of families that come to us and say, what's the minimum per month? What's the maximum? This gives you 
a great check sheet of some of the things that are excluded because many of our families don't realize what they can claim and they think everything they do for the individual, like the cost of work expenses that a blind person incurs in order to work, it doesn't count for SSI. Not all of our, our advisors, not all the people working in this industry really know it. So this is a great chart, Jerry, but that's really you know all I have to add regarding it. Well, and the good news too is regarding uh, the means test, uh, for the first time, it's been actually in committee that the means test is being reviewed to be increased. Now, they're only talking, you know, numbers like $10,000 or something, but it is in committee. It is being looked at. It hasn't been revised. It hasn't been inflationary sensitive since uh, literally uh, back into the 1960s. And so uh, that's encouraging. This particular administration and and is really uh, got a lot of disability-related enhancements in their platform of what they're trying to do. Now, whether or not all of that will happen in light of everything else that's going on, uh, but it is encouraging to see some of those kinds of things, and we'll hear a, additional uh, legislation that's out there that's taking that's in committee or taking place, affecting other areas of the lives of those with disabilities. So, uh, Kelly, why don't you start into Medicaid? I mean, we talked a little bit about Medicaid before. Basically, it's free or low health care for those that qualify. It's provided to millions of Americans. Medicaid is in, administered by the state according to federal requirements. So it's funded jointly by states and the federal government. The eligibility is for low income adults, children, pregnant women, individuals receiving SSI, elderly adults, and people with disabilities. Some states have a, a medically needy program for individuals with significant health needs whose income is too high to otherwise qualify for Medicaid under other eligibility groups. We were speaking about CHIP before, that's a perfect example. Maybe you don't qualify for Medicaid, but you qualify for CHIP. So, I mean, it's something to keep in mind, qualifications. Why is it so important? Well, we tell our advisors, we tell anyone that works in this industry, it's really, you know, when we, we work with a person with a disability, it's really having the best of both worlds. If they qualify, they can get all these government benefits, including Medicaid, and they can also put money away in a special needs trust or an ABLE account. So it's really, do they qualify? And if they do, this is a great program that's going to pay for their health care or at least a portion of their health care. And qualification is not necessarily going to be a strictly around, uh, you know, the need for health insurance per se. That's there. But conceivably, you could be on a parent's health plan. Conceivably, you could be getting Medicare and still qualify for Medicaid. And we've seen situations where all of them come into play. Medicaid is going to be the last resort generally. But it is also, when it comes to health-related plans, the richest health insurance program in the United States, in America. So whenever we're on Medicaid and get on Medicaid, and we'll talk to that a little bit more in a few minutes, then it is a benefit that we want to try to keep if at all possible. So what happens, to, Kelly, if you are getting Medicaid and you go back to work? Uh, you will continue while you're working as long as your disabling conditions still exist. So as long as you're disabled, it will continue. People think that it ends right away, that that's it, it's going to go away. That's not necessarily the case. And we've had situations where people have said that they literally are stifling, stifling some of the development of the individuals involved because they're wanting to maintain Medicaid. Or they were on one benefit like SSI and it began to be cut back or they received the children's disability benefit because of, of a life event on a parent, which pretty much wiped out the SSI. And so, you know, just know there are multiple doors to enter for applying for Medicaid. And just because of one application, the situation changes or there's more income involved or you go back to work or you're developing as an individual, it does not mean once you've had Medicaid, there is a, you, you're at that point a qualified recipient. And so there's lots of different ways to look or different doors to go through. Clearly, the more successful you are with income and asset development, then the less opportunity that you're going to have to be able to maintain Medicaid. But it doesn't mean that as you start back to work or you start to build assets, if the disability exists and remains, then there's a good possibility you're going to be able to remain on Medicaid. And that's an important factor for a lot of people. So here, 
there's another thing we talk about. If SSI stops because of the amount of earnings, just like we were just speaking, then you've got Section 1619. And that, that's really where they're calling you a qualified Medicaid recipient or qualified SSI recipient. And so the SSI may change. You, you may begin to get an offset to income that's being developed, as I said, up to about $1,310. But we've seen situations where they're making substantially more than that above the substantial gainful wage. But because they had disability-related work expenses or because there were other things involved regarding the disability and the offset that was beginning to take place, there was still some eligibility for SSI. There was still some eligibility for Medicaid. So there's a kind of a transitional thing. There's ticket to work, uh, various different work programs on a county basis, a past program that allows you to develop a, a, a program, much of which is not going to be counted as income or added as an expense that's deductible from the top. So this is an important thing to understand. A lot of, a lot of misunderstanding around here where people will literally stifle the development of an individual because they don't want to lose their SSI or they don't want to lose Medicaid. And yet, when you really delve into it, and a lot of the uh, places where they may work are becoming more and more uh, tuned in to the issues of, of public assistance benefits not ending just because the individual is becoming more productive. And so that's a thing that we need to basically look at and, and know that uh, it's not necessarily going to stop. There may be a transition period. And for Medicaid in and of itself, because of the reentry through various different doors of eligibility, chances are if you're disabled, continue to be disabled, and it impacts on your work, then you're going to be able to maintain Medicaid at some level. And, and keep in mind, Joe, too, it, it varies from state to state. So that's something to keep in mind. I mean, it's really about including people. We're all about inclusion and keeping somebody out of work when they are able to work because of this is really, you know, something of the past. So before you hesitate for the person to go to work, you may need to check into it. And it does vary from state to state. And we want people to be aware that just because you have a disability doesn't mean they can't work. If they're holding a regular job, they're getting a regular, they're getting a regular pay, you know, making a large amount of money, they really shouldn't get government benefits because that's not what they're for. They're there for those that need it, but that's not saying that they should never work because that's not correct. And we're finding more and more people with disabilities are able to work and continue to get their government benefits. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're working with families, you're working with clients, you don't want to assume that the person with a disability is never going to work because that's really not true anymore. Well, and I think it's important to understand too that if they begin to work, then they're also in the workforce and developing their own social security entitlement. And so, again, the more successful they are with income growth, then they're ultimately, if they're still disabled, and many times with congenital disabilities, you can be working and have a bona fide job, even be working and be making more than the substantial gainful wage. But because of the SSI and integrating with SSDI and ultimate entitlement benefits, there's always going to be some benefit structure there that's going to back up the situation. And then you even add to that the potential family benefits. So again, as, as people look at it as, at the preservation of SSI, it's as, just as important to look at the broader picture of everything that would be available as they continue to develop. Now, the Pickle Amendment is kind of an interesting thing. It was named after the uh, gentleman that, that put the law forward. And, and what that is basically saying, too, is if you're on one government program, like SSI, for instance, and you then qualify for the children's disability benefit, which completely offsets your SSI. Because anytime you have a dollar of SSI, then you've got to continue Medicaid. But it could be that literally another government benefit comes in and completely offsets it. And that's what the Pickle Amendment was designed to do, that you're not going to ultimately lose a Medicaid benefit or you're not going to lose some benefit because another benefit or cost of living increases on your benefit have made you ineligible because of the rise in the income. So the Pickle Amendment, when you look at then 16IDB and other options for entry for Medicaid, uh, all of these things exist. 
And that's what most people really don't understand these. It's more black and white from the standpoint of eligibility versus not. When I can, I can tell you, we can tell you that there's a lot of gray area of understanding that you can help families with in the planning, overall planning of what is taking place. Kelly, how about some additional programs? You mentioned them earlier. Yeah, I mean, I talked a little bit about them. Well, we can talk about them again, but temporary assistance for needy families. Um, it's once again, these are basically, you know, means tested. So all of these are means tested. They are available to families that need them. They can provide um, for the parents or other responsibilities. Relatives cannot provide for the family basic needs. Once again, assistance with work, assistance with daycare. Those are some of the things that some of our families really need the most help with. CHIP provides the health coverage to eligible children, um, also through both Medicaid and separate CHIP programs. Keep that in mind. And SNAP, once again, is the food stamp program um, that you have to, once again, qualify for, for these means tested. So I think we spoke quite a bit to, about these. Yes, and keep in mind too, these are mostly the federal programs when you talk about these things. People should not discount or forget to check with their state to see what state programs may exist. It could be a, a various different names at a state level, whether it's a Department of Rehab or a Department of Aging and Rehab or whatever it may be called at a state level. Many times there are caseworkers. There may be people that can assist in employment. All of those are a lot of different levels at a state level. And then in addition to that, all the way down to local county, and lots of this has to do with many times the tax base of the various different counties that are out there. You see a lot of supplementary programs in the Northeast because the tax base in these counties are pretty high. In some of the rural areas, you may not see as many of these kinds of programs, but they should definitely be checked into. These are going to be the same programs, the same groups in the counties that are administering through CMS the Medicaid programs or administering other aspects of uh, specialized programs around Social Security and that kind of thing. So don't discount the additional programs that may exist and, and at different levels. Just because right. you may not qualify today doesn't mean that as your child ages out or becomes an adult, that there may not be adult supports that they didn't even bring up or talk to before. So all of these are things to make sure you're maximizing the benefits that are available. So just before we go into tools and consideration, to preserve the benefits, some of the things that you need to keep in mind is there are waiver programs across the country as well. There are over 700 waiver programs that people with disabilities are eligible for. Can I tell you what state every single one is? No. That's why we train our advisors and we want to make people aware that there are programs available to our families that are not means-based and some are. I mean, Katie Beckett, some of those programs that these families are eligible for, a lot of them don't realize it. So what Jerry's saying is, you know, you could have went to Social Security or you could have went there years ago and they said, you're not going to qualify for any of these programs. There are different points in the person's life that they now may qualify. Your living situation change. You're in a divorce situation. The, per the person aged out. Those are some of the things to take in consideration. What I say to my families, and it's, it's really just being honest, is I could call Social Security and get an answer today. I may get another answer tomorrow. So you want to make sure that you're on top of it. You know where the local office is. Right now with COVID, I have to say that they've been better than ever with answering phones and answering questions for individuals that are curious. But if you're not sure what you're eligible for, there's no cookie cutter approach to this. Not everybody is eligible for the same thing. You have to sit down or you have to speak to them and tell them about your situation. So that's something that we always remind our families. So one of the things is, how do you preserve those government benefits? What exactly can you do to preserve them? So when we talk about that, some of the things that our families do are create a third party special needs trust. Typically, this is a trust that's created by your family members. It's not created by the person with special needs because they really don't have any money in their name. This type of trust is fantastic because you can receive all the government benefits the person's eligible for, but you can also put money in a trust for them. Now, the good thing about a third-party special needs trust is that there is not a payback on a third-party special needs trust. A first-party special needs trust is often 
um, used when the person with a disability inherits money, receives a court settlement, receives some type of a lawsuit. So the money is in their name and they have to create a first party special needs trust. Another example of when, when people say to me, Kelly, why would I create a first party special needs trust when a third party doesn't have a payback, but yet a first party special needs trust does? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. If it's a court settlement or if the person already inherited the money, it's very difficult to then get it out of their name. So you can create a first party special needs trust. And what will happen is upon the person's death, if there's any money left in there, Medicaid does have a right to come back and get that money. Now that means that if the person has received a million dollars over their life, then there's only $10 in the first party special needs trust, that's all they can get back. That is the most that they will get back from the payback and there's no other recourse. So that would be the end of it. The other place that most people put money is that we set up a third party special needs trust on behalf of the individual. You can leave life insurance in there, you can leave gifts from other people. And as soon as the money's in there, you can begin spending it in a qualified expense on behalf of the individual. So people get a little confused with the trust. It's not a checkbook. It's not for the whole family to enjoy. It's really for the benefit of the individual with the disability to make the quality of their life better. Can I pay for orthotics that are not covered? Can I pay for additional nursing that's not covered? Can I buy them an iPad once a year that's gonna help them? Those are some of the things that you can use that special needs trust for. It's not to pay for housing or food, which you can, you can take money from a special needs trust, put it into an ABLE account and pay for housing or food, but you can't out of a first party or third party special needs trust. It's really to make the quality of the life of the individual better. So when we talk about special needs trust, it's a great way to have the best of both worlds, but keep in mind, there are restrictions on a special needs trust. If I wanna take my son on a trip, I can't go into his special needs trust and take him and three of his siblings, but I can, however, pay for a caregiver to take him on a trip once a year, pay for someone to help take care of him. It has to be for the benefit of him. But the main difference between the third party and the first party is that the money in the first party is already owned by the person with special needs. You want to avoid it, but if you have no other choice, it's, it's a good way to put the money away and allow them to have the best of both worlds. Now, if you have someone that you had to set up a first party special needs trust because they inherited money, but now you want to leave them money, say you want to leave them money um, from a life insurance policy, I would not suggest that you add it to a first party special needs trust, I would probably say that you want to create a third party special needs trust, keeping in mind that you could spend the money in the first party trust, spend it down, and then you could use the money in the third party trust because in the event that the person passes away, the third party special needs trust can go back to the family, whereas the first party trust will be subject to some of the payback provisions. So, you can have two types of trust. You can have a first party and a third party, but typically most of our families are setting up what we refer to as a third party special needs trust. Joe, do you wanna add anything? Right, That's a lot of information. Yeah, that was great. And, the, and I think that uh, you make a valid point about the uh, first party trust when it, when it talks about the possible retrieval by Medicaid. The issue there too is that it's gonna be retrieved at the lowest negotiated rate that existed for the health coverages involved in that particular state. So it's not like you had a gross bill of X, but it was whatever, it's gonna be retrieved at whatever the negotiated rate is, was, which at least is the most favorable rate that it could be retrieved at. But the other thing we see sometimes is that families many times are gonna to try to preserve some of the assets that exist or some of the values that exist in both the first party and third party trust. But clearly if money is to be spent, I've had people say, you know, they've got both, we want to preserve it. And so they're using current cash or they're using current resources to pay for things versus, you know, going into their trust. Now, the first party, if it's going to be a payback, then that's the first place to go to spend the money. And if you're going to need to spend it, uh, and try to sustain what you're going to sustain in a third-party trust. If you're using current cash, then in some instances, you might be better using first-party money to drain that down over time 
and then re reallocate the money that you would have been spending to a third party trust or enable account. So just because the trust exists doesn't mean that there's not some planning involved in how you might utilize the trust to make sure you're maximizing those potential benefits. Right. And as we look I, at, you know, we, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. I mean, one of the things is you don't want to keep it a secret either. So that if you have a parent or a grandparent or someone that wants to leave the person money, I mean, you can do all this great planning. And if you don't let anyone know, it's useless because they really should be leaving things to the first party or third party special needs trust. Really, it's, it's typical that when you're looking at beneficiary designations, that if you have four children, that you need to make sure that the one with the special needs trust, that you put it the special needs trust of versus just the person outright. So, I mean, those are some of the tools that our families use when it comes to planning. Another type of trust is a pooled special needs trust which are often administered by a nonprofit for the benefit of multiple beneficiaries. It can be either first party or third party. And we have a lot of families that may not have that much that they wanna leave in a special needs trust, or they work with a wonderful nonprofit that has a pooled special needs trust, and that's where they want their trust to be because this nonprofit has always been there for them. So it's really a personal choice. When we speak about personal choices, we also speak about the Special Needs Trust Fairness Act up until 2016, a person with a disability couldn't set up their own special needs trust. Now, a person with um, a disability, nevertheless retained mental capacity, can establish their own first party special needs trust. If they own the money, they can now establish it. They don't need someone to establish it on their behalf as long as they're capable. So that's something to keep in mind because people are not aware that there were some changes in 2016 that really affected our population. Once again, advocating for independence, letting people you know, be in control of their own finances. The Special Needs Trust Fairness Act was a great move towards you know, allowing them to have that freedom. And I think that uh, this, is, this is critical legislation. This came out about the same time that we were dealing with ABLE and that legislation and other enhancements. I think it's a recognition that people with disabilities can be productive but uh, the law doesn't necessarily always fall on the side of helping them in that process because of the accumulation of assets could hurt them, those kinds of things. And so the Special Needs Trust Fairness Act, and I think the, uh, the Veterans and the Wounded Warrior Program was instrumental once again on this particular piece because you had individuals that, uh, that needed a trust, might not even have family members to help establish that. And so being able to do it on your own was an important factor. The pool trusts are nice in that you can bring together a whole bunch of people's assets together and get institutional management of the underlying assets. And yet in the, in the pool trust, your own section is compartmentalized. So you still have your own program, but you get the advantage of uh, institutional management of larger funds because of everybody pulling together all the funds that they have. The other thing we've seen, because these are run by nonprofits, is many nonprofits, when you get into a situation that uh, there may not be an easy answer to succession to caregiving or succession trustees as to who's going to administer the funds, and many nonprofits will also have advocacy components, almost like guardianship surrogacy or those kinds of things that can help with that. So, you know, the standalone trust may give us a little bit more flexibility to design more exactly what we want, but depending upon the resources, both human resources and other assets that are available, a pooled trust through a nonprofit may offer some advantages that allows the person to get, to get some better advocacy toward uh, help in the future when the primary caregivers or parents are no longer around. So these, so, are, these are all critical, important pieces. Yeah, so, Jar, sure. just a couple things. We're getting a couple comments in some of the chat that a first party trust allows the money to go farther because Medicaid benefits at the rates are substantially less expensive. And I think we addressed that. It's not your choice, though. I mean, I think that if you had a choice to set up a first party or a third party trust, you're definitely going to go with the third party because there is no payback provision. So it, first party trust is not a bad thing. You're putting money away. But keep in mind, there's a payback provision. So I don't think that always makes it great. But if that's the only route you can go, then it's fine. 
The other thing is, what's the age that you can set up a special needs trust up to? And I believe, Jerry, it's 65, correct? That you can correct. set up that's a correct. special needs trust. Now, that's not for ABLE. We'll talk about ABLE really quickly. I know we're tough on time today, but 65 is the age. And does Social Security need to approve a first party trust? Typically, they do. Once you have a first party trust, Social Security does go in and take a look at it. And if they want revisions, they will let you know so that you can let the attorney know that you're working with. So Social Security does get a copy of it, <clears throat> excuse me, and they do monitor it. So just to let you know, when you have a first party trust, they typically do know about it and they will put a lien on any type of settlement prior to monies being dispersed at the death of the individual. All right, Jeff. I think those are important comments. Those are important comments too when it talks about the payback provision because it is at the most favorable renegotiated rate. At the same time, again, we get the conflict of wanting to retain funds, and we, you know, have situations sometimes where it's not significant money, and so the cost of setting up a first party trust versus a spend down versus other options. So this is where you really need to have an understanding of the best way to go with these various different options that exist. So Kelly, how about uh, looking at the beneficiary arrangements? The, uh, we're talking about here when you've got assets and you've got individuals and, and most of the documents these days are gonna have the ability to unwind the situation if uh, the situation changes, meaning if uh, whatever it is as far as the disability improves itself that the need for a trust might not be there. But all of this are, you know, talk about titling things as far as who owns it, where the beneficiaries are going to be existent, having the beneficiary arrangements, the transference on death or PODs so that no assets are going to spill to the individual that could cause a problem for government benefits. There's so many different things. When you look at employer benefits, when you look at group life insurance or 401ks or even an HSA, people will forget to put a beneficiary arrangement on an HSA, yet in a common disaster, that might end up in a purse derpies distribution to all the kids, one of which or two of which might be special needs and it could screw up the benefit structures. So this process of making sure the transference, the titling and transference arrangements to successors and today with the SECURE Act and the way they handle people with disabilities, children, adult children with disabilities differently than they handle other children, it's important to understand the type of asset, how is it going to spill, what's the best way to get tax efficiency, and at the same time, avoid probate and really build a program that is meeting the needs of the individuals involved. Kelly, anything to add there? Yeah, just, to, I mean, I think some of us have, you know, life insurance through work and we're not even aware of it. And as you all know, our divorce rate is extremely high. We're in the 90 percentile as far as special needs families with the divorce rate is extremely high. So if it's not going to your former spouse, um, it goes directly to your children. And I don't even think people realize they may have a term policy or something at work and they've never checked the beneficiary designation. So you want to make sure that if you do establish a trust that you let others know and that you can name the trust as the beneficiary. And it's important to do that. You know, special needs trust can be established if you if you don't not able to do a first party, a third party. Now you can also do it. Um, through your will. So there are many ways in which our families can establish a trust. I mean, ideally, it's not great to have it done through your will because it's not going to be established until something happens to you, but it's yet another way to do it to make sure that those assets go to the, the trust properly as well as your other family members. So, Jerry, I guess we got to move along. We only have about 10 minutes left. I know we have a lot of questions. I've been trying to answer some of them, but we will answer all of them afterwards. We'll get a copy of all the questions and we will send answers to everybody that had asked a question today. I'll take about five minutes to quickly go through ABLE. And I think most people are gonna be somewhat familiar with this already, but it's a tax favored way to accumulate. It was built after the 529 section like college plans, but 529A, which allows an individual with a disability. There are some criteria. If you're on SSI, then you're going to uh, SSI or SSDI automatically be there. But as an individual, you can also get a medical determination to be eligible. The disability has to have been manifested prior to the age of 26, and that makes you eligible. 
The, uh, there's legislation pending right now to take that to age 46. It's still in committee, hasn't been released, does have a, a revenue uh, tag to it that uh, would cost several uh, several billion dollars to do that, but it's something that is being looked at. The uh, When we look at it, the maximum contribution in 2021 is 15000 You can do transfers out of a special needs trust into an ABLE account. You can also do transfers from a 529 college plan into an ABLE account. All of those do count toward the $15,000. If the individual is also working, they can do up to $12,760 of their own uh, earned income. It goes in after tax, but then accumulates on a tax-favored basis within the ABLE, which allows for a, a, a higher amount of contribution. The limits are going to vary for as low as uh, 235000 in one state, all the way to as high as 529000 So if somebody is on SSI, then you don't want to exceed the 100000 limit inside of the uh, ABLE account because that would suspend your SSI. It would not suspend Medicaid, and it's only a suspension. <laughs> it's not a termination. There are some uh, uses of uh, household-related expenses in ABLE that don't exist within special needs trust, giving us more overall flexibility. The assets, ABLE assets are going to be disregarded when it comes to Medicaid eligibility, and it is a Medicaid payback. So if there is assets and when the individual passes away, it can pen- potentially be a Medicaid payback, much like a first-party trust. But there are currently 10 states and other states that have passed legislation that are not going to be doing Medicaid recovery. That number seems to be growing. And there's also talk on the Hill federally of changing the rule where Medicaid may not be recovered from ABLE. doesn't exist today. A few states, it's never been tested. uh, So we don't know necessarily how CMS or, or, or Medicaid recovery will be it's, if it, until it's tested in a few states, but we now have 10 states that basically have passed the legislation around not non-recovery. Uh, you can accumulate, if you're not on SSI, it's a tax-free accumulation that I like it much to a Roth. And so it, it gives a, it, it's like watershed uh, the legislation that really allows for the first time a significant amount of accumulation for those with disabilities. We're also seeing on the Hill a lot of discussion of the use of ABLE accounts as a fringe benefit in conjunction with a 401k where monies can be put in by employers and have it not count against the means test in a matching and or voluntary contribution from the individual. That causes a problem today for those that are employed and wanting to participate in 401k plans. And so this would uh, take care of that. That's also in committee for House Ways and Means. And we're hoping that that may become, it was not made a part of the SECURE Act, uh, but we're hoping that that may come out on its own legislation. So that's a quick and dirty about ABLE account. That is, uh, fine, final remarks there, Kelly? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that, that ABLE was supposed to do is really create this sense of independence for individuals. So you don't have an adult going to his mother to get you know $20 to go out to dinner. So people say to us, you know, Kelly, do I need both? Jerry and I talk to families all the time. So why don't I just have a special needs trust versus an ABLE? Or why can't I just have an ABLE and not a special needs trust? It's really, you know, in most cases, it's good to maybe have both. It can benefit an individual because keep in mind, I had alluded to it before that you can't pay for food and shelter from a third party special needs trust or a first party special needs trust. But you can transfer money to an ABLE so that the individual can pay for their own rent. They can have money to go out to dinner. And ABLE, that is, a, that is permitted for them to take it out of ABLE. The other thing is it does create that independence that we were looking to create for individuals. But what I always say is that it's not a savings account because there are only 10 states right now. And hopefully all the states won't have a payback provision. But if you leave a lot of money in ABLE and something happens to the individual, the money goes back to the state. So you wanna keep that in mind, but do a lot of our families have them and allow the person to make some of their own decisions, pay their own rent? Absolutely. So it's a good way to have the best of both worlds and you know, ABLE's pretty easy to set up. So it's something that is definitely an option for many of our families. And what I say 
is if you've done nothing else, at least consider ABLE. All right, Jeff. Yeah, a lot of different ABLE, yeah, a lot of different ABLE programs across the country. Be familiar with the ones in your own state. There are some national programs. There are tax ramifications of deductibility in some states. So it's important really to become familiar. The National ABLE Resource Center does a great comparison of all the various ones that are out there. So Jerry, we do have a couple questions. I can read a few if you want to uh, if you want to try to address a few. So we need to set up the third party special needs trust first is one of the questions. And my answer is if the person doesn't own money in their name and they're not in that look back period, yes, a third party special needs trust would be first. Um, you would not want to set up a first party special needs trust unless you have to. So I would say, yes, third party would be first. Um, are there other payback provisions besides just Medicaid? Uh, generally not. I mean, that's the primary payback provision. There may be some uh, county-based or other programs, but it's uh, the Medicaid payback is the primary payback issue. So this is kind of an interesting one. Is Social Security involved with the first party special needs trust, even if you are not receiving benefits? And we could go back and forth on this one. I typically, you know, once you apply for benefits, it does make them aware of it. I can tell you from my own personal experience, they do know about first party special needs trust. So in the event that down the road, you're gonna take benefits, they put a lien or they do in some cases check to see if you have a first party special needs trust. Joe, do you have any comments on we that about social security? Yeah, we didn't used to be, we didn't used to be asked, but now when people are applying, they're wanting to see uh, whatever trust might exist to make sure the language is appropriate. And so I think sometimes they're just checking language, but uh, we've had situations where both first party and third party have been reviewed by social security uh, in anticipation of any benefit being paid. And then I'm getting, um, do ABLE and a 529 have to be the same owner? Typically a 529 can be rolled into an ABLE account Usually if you have an ABLE, you don't have a 529 anymore. It's, it's similar to a 529 and has some of the same bells and whistles, but typically we don't have people that have an ABLE and a 529. Well, uh, an, uh, an ABLE account, the beneficiary is the individual with a disability. You're only allowed to, one, to have one ABLE account and the individual with a disability will be that. Anybody can make contributions to it. Uh, you could have, you know, uh, 15 people make a thousand dollars each. Uh, so it's much more flexible on, 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 well, it's flexible on pay in of various different contributions, college plans. You could have five different college plans. You could have grandparents that have taken them out. You could have parents that have taken them out. Uh, you can roll money from a college uh, plan into an able under the same $15,000 annual restriction. Uh, but a little bit more flexibility as to the number of accounts, who can do it uh, when it comes to college plans versus ABLE accounts, uh, the, and some flexibility for rolling them together, but there will only be one ABLE account at any given point in time. So another question we're getting is, if you use ABLE accounts to pay for housing expenses, will it reduce your SSI benefits? There's an offset. There's offset language. Uh, we've not seen a lot of that applied, uh, but if, you're, if, it's, if it's based on, depending upon the way we're seeing it, and it's based on expenses related, like maintenance or those kinds of things, we don't see that, that as being an offset. But it follows the same, by definition, the same parameters that you see inside of, the, uh, of, of a special needs trust as far as the way it's applied. But generally, we're only seeing it used primarily not for uh, as, as maintenance expenses or taxes or related household expenses, uh, which are legitimate. Claiming the rent, isn't that also income that is taxable to the landlord? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's uh, one of the most frequently asked questions. Uh, when you ask a CPA about any kind of uh, income coming in, they say if you see a dollar on the street, you're supposed to declare it. Uh, the way I view this, and again, this is my personal opinion, and you'll remember the disclaimer up front, we're not tax accountants, we're not attorneys. But my personal opinion is, is SSI is coming in 
as non-taxable income. When it's received in the household to a representative payee, it's non-taxable income. If the family has had expenses, they are reimbursing themselves for the expenses that they have had. So I personally don't see that as income per se. I see it as a reimbursement, and that's why we call it room and board. Uh, an accountant, CPA, looking at it, every accountant that we've had come work with us and speak with us are concerned it's a it's a form of income. So it's in the gray area. I leave it to up to the families. So I try to educate them as much as we possibly can. It's in the gray area. We won't find it in writing not to, but I also uh, have not found it where you're, it's telling you to do it since it is a reimbursement for non-taxable income. So when it's in that gray area, we have um, Tom Brinker, who heads up the center at the American College, who is one of those guys that know all the information about taxes. So we definitely try to refer to a professional when it comes to some of those questions. Anything gray, we would suggest that you go to the person that handles your taxes, as in the attorneys. It's somebody that hopefully works in this area. So I do see that we tried to answer some of the questions. There are still quite a few more. Um, and we will reach out to the college and get as many of those as possible. But we are at the top of the hour. And Jerry and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for coming through the American College, who does have the um, chartered designation. And um, I would say that if you are not a special needs planner that holds this designation, you should definitely take a look at it. It's a great program. And thank you so much for joining us today. And Jerry, thank you for helping me today. Thank you.